We're looking at the end of our ability to sustain ourselves as humans on this planet. All of the world's rainforests are being threatened by agribusiness. Here in the U.S., the largest cause of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is the coal industry. It's not fair that I have to inherit a carbon-based economy. There's an environmental crisis in terms of the amount of oil we're extracting, further pushing its appetite, further searching for this fuel that we all depend on. What makes the Rainforest Action Network unique is that it campaigns not only for forest ecosystems, but their inhabitants and the systems that support life. The tactics we use are aimed at shifting the global marketplace. All over the world we're experiencing food riots, we're experiencing droughts, we're experiencing hurricanes and superstorms. Rain clouds produced in the Amazon go all the way north to Iowa, they go all the way south to Argentina. If we don't have clouds that are produced in the Amazon, we cannot grow food. The driver of the problem of climate change is the same driver of massive human rights and health and public health abuses. Unfortunately, there's a you know, global power structure in play that increasingly shifts the world's resources and wealth into the hands of a few very rich corporations that aren't accountable. It's very difficult to challenge corporate power, especially when corporations continue to be handed down power. And so what we see is a lot of power in very few hands. They look great, they look sexy, they're fantastic looking, all those cars. Part of this campaigning is about this, the social contract that we as citizens give to corporations. We as citizens have a right to revoke the social contract when the corporation is, is behaving out of bounds. The U.S. used to have very good vigilance over its corporations. You know, they used to be very much in service of the people, and people could withdraw the, their right to operate. Who said that corporations can, for the sake of a return to their shareholders, blow up mountains just for a profit? Who, who said that that's okay? RAN is trying to directly work to challenge corporations um, to go beyond just those small statements of what they're doing in theory. We found out that Patricia Wirtz, the CEO of ADM, was speaking at a conference and she spoke about alternative fuels and how ADM was providing alternative fuels for the planet. Bria Morgan, our rainforest agribusiness campaigner, and Lavana Saxon got up and asked her, will you stop destroying rainforests for agrofuels? She was very taken aback and she wouldn't sign the pledge. If you're financing the destruction of old growth rainforests, you deserve to be embarrassed. You deserve to be hauled out in front of your peers, in front of your shareholders, in front of the media, and told to stop. I have with me today a pledge for Rick to sign here, committing General Motors to become the leader in fuel economy by 2010. Rick, could you do us the honors? I think my speech spoke for itself, but I appreciate your oh, support. Okay. I'm sorry you have to leave now. Thanks very much. And for some moron you know, who maybe has like a few years of college to talk about, you know, we ought to do this and that. This is complete nonsense. Those people have no idea what they're talking about. Few people ever truly give up power voluntarily. It needs to actually be taken from them. It doesn't need to be taken violently, but it needs to be taken. It's not a true power unless we've actually earned it and taken it from the grassroots. The way we measure success at RAN isn't always by um, the changes that we're seeing, but it's also partly uh, the friends that we're making. This work isn't about RAN. You know, let's be real. We are a little bitty office. We have 40 people. If we didn't have grassroots networks, if it were simply 40 people trying to change corporate power, then it would never happen. There's really a large variety of both inside kind of negotiation type strategies as well as outside real grassroots strategies we use. We have folks in the organization who are going in and negotiating um, with the CEOs of these companies and the CEOs know that there's people outside that are getting really angry and that puts a certain amount of pressure on them to do the right thing. I think there's a whole lot of reason to hope that in the, in the short history of this country we've seen popular movements and people's movements rise up to change you know, the face of our nation. If we come to people and say, hey, we have a plan, we have a strategy to win and here's how we're going to do it, people jump at the chance to get involved. It presents both one of the world's largest challenges and one of the, the biggest opportunities for us to come together. No 
change has ever occurred with just one person. It's always been, you know, social movements. It's always been lots of people working together. We've been able to change the policies of Home Depot, the world's largest retailer of old growth wood products. It didn't take one letter or one demonstration to change what Home Depot was doing. It took tens of thousands of letters, thousands of demonstrations. We're definitely coming from a lot of social movements. One of my greatest hopes for the youth climate movement is that we'll be able to, to really reframe environmentalism in a way that's a lot more effective and a lot more appealing to a huge, broad range of people and to really engage a diversity of communities. We practice solidarity with other groups who who are struggling for power within their own context. Paper was coming out of the Grassy Narrows First Nation and going as pulp to Boise Incorporated. And Boise was selling paper to Office Max in the United States and Grandin Toy in Canada. We had about 30 demonstrations across the country. People went to Office Max dressed as homeless caribou and angry shoppers and told the store managers that they were purchasing wood from Grassy Narrows. Abitibi is the logging company that's doing all the logging in Grassy Narrows, announced that they were going to be pulling out of the Grassy Narrows First Nation effective immediately. There was much rejoicing in the RAN office. We called all of our activists and there was a lot of screaming and crying on the telephones that day. That's a really clear example where people decided to plan stuff together do their own thing locally, and real change happens. Our activists on the ground really make Rand what it is. Rand wouldn't exist without the ferociousness of grassroots networks. When I found out about activism, and I found out about organizing, and I found out about social movements, there was this huge sea change for me where before, when I didn't understand how I could make change, I, I almost didn't want to know. Now when I hear about something, some horrible injustice, I now think, oh great, like how can I change this? Nearly everything that RAND does is based on masses of people taking action to let corporations know that business as usual is just not okay. You can be anywhere, send us an email, and we will get you trained, we'll get you hooked up with other people. A lot of it is about really giving people the skills they need as activists to go out and organize locally in their communities, organize nationally on issues that they care about. Everything from how hour by hour, day by day, to plan and host a fundraiser for your local campaign. We put up what we have and turn it into a forum where anyone else can add their thoughts, add their experiences, and these documents and these guides evolve over time. We want to give people tools for how to design a campaign. We want people to, to run with it and to be creative and to think of ways to, to push the envelope and to be really great organizers. This idea that people come together, challenge corporations directly to make on-the-ground changes, and then have it work does work. I mean, it works over and over and over again.